This video has been sponsored by italki. Do you want to learn a new language in the new year of 2022? How to learn a new language within a short time? The most efficient way to master a foreign language is simply speaking with the real humans. I recommend you to check out on italki italki is an education platform that provides one-on-one -on -one lessons from native speakers who know the real deal what really special about italki is they have niche classes such as chinese dialect the cantonese hakka hokkien shanghainese taiwanese or even business english if you want to ace a job interview in the new year so I'm going to show you my interface of italki platform. The perks I want to share with you is to make use of the trial classes at a cheaper price to see which teacher best suited to your style. And since I know Mandarin, Cantonese and Hakka, I chose Khmer, the Cambodian language because I think Cambodia is an uprising developing country and mastering basic Khmer might be useful for my future career. So this is my teacher Mao from Siem Reap. He is really friendly and I got to tell you how effective it is to learn directly from the native teachers. Nowadays, you can learn any languages you want through YouTube, but a native skill teacher will lay out a proper lesson with complete teaching material such as a flashcard, image files, and also some homework. So I do not feel I'm learning the language but not able to practice it fundamentally. Mao taught me simple greetings and also how to read Khmer in just 30 minutes. I got to say this is really effective and time saving to pick up a new language. So no matter you are working from home, waiting at the commute or simply running chores, you have a complete and flexible access with a live teacher at italki. Make sure you register on italki today. In this new year, italki is giving out one year free lessons to 22 lucky winners. And what's more, if you have bought $20 worth of lessons on italki, 500 of you will stand a chance to win an extra $10 coupon. And on the other hand, if you have bought $10 worth of lessons, 1,500 of you will stand a chance to win a $5 coupon. So make sure you register today. Link on the description box down below. In the new year, I wish all of you to master a new language skill at a fraction of the cost. And now let us go to the video of Langfang Republic. Do you know there was a disappearing Chinese nation existed in today's Indonesia 246 years ago? How powerful was this nation? Why it was established in the first place? And why is that not many people know about them? Hi, my name is Ivan and welcome to Fearless Passport. Today we want to talk about Lanfang Republic, the first ever autonomous federation in Asia built by our forgotten southern Chinese miners in West Kalimantan. China and Indonesia have been related in many ways at least since the 9th century, some 600 years before the Western Sea Powers came in. In the old times of 1700, the area of now West Kalimantan has abundance of natural resources, especially tin and gold. The arrival of the Chinese miners in West Kalimantan during the 18th century was on the initiatives of Malay sultans and the strength of Chinese mining lay in the superior technology that uses a complicated hydraulic system to inject water into the gutter to wash away lighter soils and leave the heavier gold particles behind. And this mining technology yielded the maximum results for minimum physical effort. And as the gold mine is expanding, the miners reached tens of thousands of people. There were at least two major linguistic groups represent among the Chinese. First is the Teochew, the Caozhou people, and also the Ke, Ke Jiaren, Hakka. The Teochew are from the coastal region in China, so naturally they were the traders and craftsmen and concentrated along the sea. The Hakka, on the other hand, originated from the mountainous and hilly areas, so they made up the majority of the miners concentrated in the inland mining activities. Beside the Teochew, there were also existence of the South Hokkienese, the Minnan people, whose language is close to Teochew but not similar enough to understand each other. Another kind of Hakka is also called Ban San Ke. 
Hap Hakka and also Hap Hoklo refers to the people from Feng Sun, He Po, Hai Feng and Lu Feng, which spoke a Hakka dialect slightly different from Jia Ying Zhou. Most of the Chinese laborers came from the southern mainland of China with family members or ties from the same village. Therefore, when they arrived in the foreign land in West Kalimantan, they set up the original associations to help each other to survive in the extremely difficult natural conditions and also working environment. These laborers formed their own mining corporations named Gongsi. The word Gongsi, if translated to Mandarin, is known as company, Gongsi, or a common management, a structure or corporations operated by the overseas Chinese laborers working in several gold mines in West Kalimantan. The sultans who brought them in would supply the miners with tools, rice, fish, and other provisions. In return, the Chinese were required to pay a huge sum of tributes in gold. It is hard to determine how many Hui or associations existed in West Borneo back in the times. And based on my readings, there were at least 14 mining organizations and two agricultural associations in Montrado regions before the establishment of the He Sun Zongting in 1776. The famous mining companies were the Da Gang, the Big Harbor in Montrado, San Tiao Go, the Three Gullies in Bermangat, and there were also clan based organizations such as Sanxing Jinghu, Ju Sheng Gong Si, Si Da Jia Wei, and Lan He Ying. They are all formed by Hakkas originated from Da Pu district in China. Therefore, by rough estimations, there were at least 30 to 40 associations scattered in the region. And back then, there wasn't a clear borders between Indonesia and Malaysia. The entire Borneo was owned by several or near to 10 Malay sultans. The vast majority of these locals are called Dayak and their economic life was generally based on the agricultural of slash and burn type. So they are the nomadic forest dwellers and living from fishing and hunting. So when the rapid development of the mining industries brought overwhelming wealth to the miners, there were conflict of interest started to be apparent between different involving parties. Due to different blood ties of the companies, there were frequent armed fights for the mining territory. For example, in 1830s, San Tiao Go was defeated by the larger Da Gang Company. One of the leaders from San Tiao Go, his name is Liu San Bang, led about 4,000 miners of the company to cross the borders. To be exact, they were crossing a mountain in three batches to a place called Bao in Sarawak. The internal conflicts between the Gongsis, monopoly and suppressions from the three at Tian Di Hui urged the 14 mining associations to establish the He Sun Zongting. Zongting translated as Assembly Hall, but in fact, the Zongting is a combined function of a parliament and an executive council, a presidency, and also an army headquarters and a public congress hall. So beside all of this, the Zongting was also a temple. The main hall had altars to Da Bo Gong and Guan Di Gong, and its headquarters building was situated at the bazaar of Montrado, and its leader was chosen from among its members. In 1772, on the 37 years of Qianlong Ring of Qing Dynasty, a Hakka Chinese man named Luo Fang Bo, hailed from the Meizhou Shishan Zhen Xinan Chun in the Guangdong province, traveled to Sambas in conjunction with the Go Rush trend. At first, Luo Fang Bo started his career in teaching. He was educated, diplomatic, and not soon after, he was selected as the chairman, the Da Tang Zongzang, of one of the agricultural associations, namely Lan Fang Associations. At this stage, Lan Fang was still a small company with agricultural business, not the mining business. It was only after the fall of the Triya, the Tian Di Hui, it became the allies with the 14 mining associations and formed Lan Fang Gong Si. As the inaugural leader for the associations, Luo Fang Bo acted as the negotiator of middle persons between He Sun and also the local Sultanate. Hence, the Lanfang Federations were first established in 1777 with its capital in Mando. The mining companies paid tax to Lanfang Republic in return for protection. Remember in the first place we mentioned that the entire Borneo was owned by several or near to 10 Malay Sultans? 
in 1789 as the Kesultanan Pontianak tried to expand their territory to the area of Kesultanan Landak, the Sultan of Pontianak invited the Dutch and Lanfang to join him as his ally. The war between the Dutch, Pontianak and Lanfang against the Landak turned out to be a victory and the result, Luofang Bo successfully gained more trust from Pontianak Sultan. Hence, Lanfang were given wider autonomy to self-manage under the observations of Pontianak Sultanate. During the rule of Lanfang Federations, Luofang Bo maintained a close contact with the mainland China by declaring themselves as the tributary of the Qing dynasty. This is because the powerful authority of the Qing dynasty would never allow their citizens to become an equal king in a foreign land or else the remaining family in the Guangdong province will all be persecuted as the country's betrayer. The way that Lanfang Gongxi chairman was elected at that time, according to in today's standards, it was very democratic, mainly because the Gongxi chairman was elected through a general election by all Gongxi members and Luofang Bo implemented many democratic principles and his administration's divisions included three tiers from the province, prefecture and county with the people electing leaders for all levels. The first one is their military. The Republic did not have any standing military but they had a defence ministry that administered a national military based on the national service. There weren't any huge standing troops, trained and all time ready to serve the Republic but they recruit young people of right age to practice shooting and also self-defence. In the financial and economic aspect, Lanfang was equipped with a complete taxation system to enrich the national treasury. They collect the taxes from each of the business including farmers, gold miners and traders. As part of the social contract, the money was used to build infrastructures and also to provide convenience to the local community. They also established their own Langfang currency. And in education-wise, although Luofang Bo discarded the ancient Chinese institutions of monarchism and also the dynastic successions, he continued to adhere to many of the Chinese traditions that carry along to Borneo. For example, he organized a Chinese language school and hired Confucian scholars focusing on the traditional Chinese culture. Another reason for the success of the Chinese enterprise was the fact that the immigrants upheld the principle of equality. In fact, the chief of the He Sun Zong team were recruited not only among the Hakka and Ban San Ke, the officials were also sought among the Hokkiens. And this principle of equality also applied to Dayaks. The Dayak women are not only appreciated for their beauty, in fact, Luo Fang Bo, he has a Dayak wife when he was past Kalimantan. Luo Fang Bo was the head of the state for 19 years and he finally died of illness in 1795 at the age of 58 years old. And before the Dutch came, there were another 10 other successors. And since the video is too long, I'll split the entire story into two parts. In part two, we will talk about the dying of Lanfang Republic and also the history of the Chinese settlers in Sarawak, Malaysia. So if you want to understand the entire, the most detailed Lanfang Republic story on YouTube, please give me a like, a subscribe and also turn on all for the notifications. I will release the part 2 probably tomorrow. So please share this video to 3 of your WhatsApp groups so that you will not miss out the video. And I will see you in next, in tomorrow. Bye bye.